Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming in, especially just immediately after the lunch. So I'm sure uh, you guys might be slightly over on glucose. We'll make it as interesting as possible. Uh, my name is Samir. Uh, I'm a managing director with Primus. I've had the privilege of assisting uh, uh, Apoor sir as he drove the whole AVGC policy at the national level. Uh, if I were to just set the context of why we are here to look at AVGC under the larger media uh, entertainment space, uh, if you really look at Avengers, Avatar, uh, uh, Game of Thrones, Top Gun, each of these have a common point uh, in form of an Indian play, uh, wherein an Indian studio is behind some of the amazing uh, shots that have become uh, a billion dollar enterprise. But when we talk about that, uh, it's a matter of pride, but also uh, a matter of concern. Matter of pride, why? Because India is playing such a big role in global cinema, but also a matter of concern as to how little do we know about our own strengths and what more, uh, what uh, we else we could be doing. Uh, and and there are many reasons to that, right? Uh, whether it's the, uh, the, the skilled youth that are available, the infrastructure that's available, the policy environment, uh, how well do we interact with the global audience? How well do we use the digital platforms? Many more reasons uh, that are there. And for a country as big as India, where uh, we are 18% of the global population, uh, contributing to more than 3% of the GDP, but our share of the AVGC global revenue is less than 1%, and that has to change. And that's where uh, Honorable Finance Minister announced uh, a task force for AVGC and make India one of the global hubs uh, on, in this particular sector. And, uh, and who better than uh, the people sitting on the dais here today who have each contributed to creating that frame within which India would take a collective action to realize uh, India's potential. And within the next three to five years, acquire more than 5% of the global share. That's the goal. Uh, joined here by Shri Apoor Chandra, uh, the Secretary of Ministry of Information Broadcasting, who has uh, been the chair of the task force on AVGC. And under his leadership, uh, the academia, the industry, uh, the various state uh, states, the central governments have all come together uh, to make this uh, policy come out. Uh, we also have uh, Ms. Megha Tata, uh, who is the CEO, of, uh, CEO at Cosmos Maya, uh, one of the leaders in the animation space, uh, and also focusing a lot on creating Indian IP. So we'll be very keen to hear from you. Uh, we also have Munjal Shroff, uh, who is the co-founder at Graffiti Multimedia, Someone who has been championing the idea of creating Indian originated content. And uh, we have great stories that he will be telling us and how what we can learn from that. We have Mr. Biren Ghosh, who is the country head for Technicolor, uh, the, the name behind some of the major blockbusters at the global level. He has been associated with this uh, sector for over 15 years, has been at, sorry? Maybe since the coining of the word AVGC, but yes, <laughs> 15, 15 in Technicolor. So, uh, Birin has been one of the main voices as we had uh, worked towards creating a coherent policy. We also have Ashish Kulkarni, founder of Punaryog Multimedia. Uh, here he is. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I would say in more than one ways, the grandfather of this movement has been championing the cause of AVGC for many, many years. Uh, both at the central level, but also at the state levels. He has advised many states in creating their AVGC policies. And since uh, the national policy has come about, many states have uh, shown interest in how she's been advising. And then also we have Jail Tucker, uh, the head of multimedia practice at Deloitte, someone who has seen the complete value chain of the media and entertainment space, not only India, but across, and has been advising private sector and public sector on how do you mainstream India into the ME space. So thank you all of you for being here and sharing uh, with us and everyone what your thoughts are as India takes on an ABGC poll position in the times to come. Uh, I would have asked sir to speak, but uh, then sir suggested that he has already spoken enough. Um, so uh, I would start right away with a series of questions to uh, everyone here. Uh, with the focus that they all have. Uh, sir, my question to you first, of course. Uh, uh, with the national policy that uh, it's at the anvil of uh, being, uh, being made formal by the cabinet, uh, 
Uh, something that you had talked about is how do you bring the public and the private sector together and also the center and the state together and also the many line ministries together because this sector will only succeed when we are looking at every aspect of it, whether it's education, skilling, or industry development, or IP creation, or, or even export potential. So I would like to hear your views as to how do you intend and how does this policy help bring it all together because that's a challenge, sir. Uh, actually, all those who are working with us in the, on the EVGC policy, they are all on the dais. So they are all knowledgeable enough and they were all part of the creation of the AVGC uh, policy and uh, AVGC task force. As you mentioned, Samir, the AVGC requires uh, a cross-section of uh, work from various, uh, various ministries, various state governments, and they all have to come together, especially to meet the challenge of education and skilling. Then the states have to contribute in terms of infrastructure. And uh, when the task force was created, we involved uh, the various ministries as well as the state governments, and they were all a part of it. So the, and, and of course the industry, the doyens of industry in the AVGC sector, they are also sitting on the dais and they were all part of it. And we, the report which was pre created was a collective effort of the concerned ministries, the, uh, uh, the industry as such, the private industry, which is involved in AVGC and which has strong interest, as well as the educational sector of AVGC and their experiences in that, as well as some of the state comments. Uh, after the report was uh, uh, formulated, we threw it open to for public, uh, for comments of the stakeholders, and we have received a number of comments. Those also are getting incorporated, and now we are in the process of finalizing the cabinet note for the national policy, which is uh, which will go for interministerial consultation, and thereafter, uh, the final policy can be announced. Uh, we have held a session with the state governments on the 20th of April, where almost 25 state governments were represented. We have put out a draft AVGC policy for the state governments in public domain. And uh, uh, the, in that uh, conclave, the state governments were told what, uh, the, what is expected of them. Some had some questions and they were ably replied. And now I'm sure that the industry also will take it forward while we have put it out to the state governments to frame their own policy. Some of the state governments are ahead, especially Karnataka, Telangana, Maharashtra, who are already doing something in terms of the AVGC policy. And it is for the others to take it ahead. As regards uh, skilling and education, because that is the core of making manpower available, there the, uh, we are in touch with the education department of the government of India, as well as NCRT and all the other stakeholders, All India Council for uh, technical education to, in, to incorporate animation courses uh, and uh, visual effect courses into school curriculums at the starting from six onwards in the, into computer science and, uh, and the activities curriculum as well as skilling later on and start and a standardization of the uh, courses at graduate level, postgraduate level and subsequently. The we are also, uh, I mean, what has been talked about for a long time is the National Center for Excellence. The National Center for Excellence has been on the drawing board for almost seven, eight years now, but we hope that now this is the final year. And uh, there again, we want to involve the private sector. We are partnering with CIA and FIKI. FIKI, of course, is here, I mean, is organizing this event. So that the character of the NCOE remains a private sector entity, not a government entity. So that it gives more flexibility in terms of operations, in terms of hiring of faculty, hiring of manpower, and uh, designing the courses. And uh, we hope that we would be able to begin this uh, NCOE during the course of this year through accommodation which is already available with the Film Division at Pedder Road in Mumbai. We also want to create regional centers for NCOE, not just one center at Mumbai, five, six regional centers as things go along so that we can train more and more people uh, more and more children and uh, meet the needs of the industry. So uh, that is how we propose to go about. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. Next question to you, Munjal, is, uh, and if we just extend this point about 
how the governments and the, the private sector comes together, you with Ministry of INB uh, have collaborated to create uh, the uh, Krish Trish and the Bartley Boy Bharat Hai Ham, uh, which uh, basically celebrates the unsung heroes of India's independence. Uh, just tell us about how was this journey and how can this be replicated more? Because uh, this collaboration, something if done well, can really create a multiplier effect. Yeah, thanks, Amit. So I think uh, as graffiti, you know, we've always believed in the India story and content coming from India and not just for the domestic market, but also for the international market. Our journey with KDB actually started with uh, when Mega was heading Cartoon Network, you know, and we produced a couple of movies and we took it to Cartoon Network for an acquisition. And subsequently, that relationship extended and we produced uh, six movies with them in all. That franchise went to about eight movies, I think close to about 40 million kids on sea and watched it. Then in 2017, those movies were acquired by Netflix and released in 150 countries in Hindi, English, Turkish, Polish, Chinese, and Korean. And I think that was a huge endorsement for the fact that content which is as Indian as it can get because these are traditional stories, folk stories using folk art, folk music, you know, that going on a platform like Netflix and then being, you know, uh, subtitled in so many languages was, was a big thumbs up that, you know, that there's a hunger for Indian content, there's a hunger for good quality content, you know, and then I think as subsequently when we, we realized that we wanted to continue on that path, so we, we were very keen to also bring to kids some of the unsung stories from the Indian freedom struggle, and which is where we presented the idea to the ministry. It was a pitch that the ministry had put out, and we won the pitch, uh, and subsequently it got greenlit. So we are now doing the show, and very happy to share that. Uh, we are producing about 52 episodes, you know, on different, so across all the states, uh, you know, we are focusing on uh, Northeast, we are focusing on a lot of women characters from the freedom struggle who most people don't know about, you know. So I think it's about that, and I think as we dived into this, we realized that there are so many such stories, you know, I mean, in our own research over the last 12 years on KTB, uh, we found lots of amazing children's literature that exist in virtually every state. Uh, and I think that needs to be brought out and that content resonates with not just within our country but even outside our country. Similarly, I think what we're doing with the freedom fighters, I mean eventually these are stories of Vela freedom, you know, about celebrating, you know, the commitment that these people had. You know, I mean, you have to understand that our struggle started, you know, it took almost 400 years. India as a concept didn't exist then, right? as a nation, but these people fought for certain values, and these values of freedom are universal, right? So we believe that these will not only work well with our audiences, but even for an international audience as well. And I think there's, a, there's an opportunity for every state as well to look at their own culture, their own stories, their own history, and help bring that, those kind of stories to the fore. But I think really there's potential for some very unique content. And there's a market now for it. I may come in because with Munjal, I think it is one of the first collaborations which we in the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting are directly having with the private producer to produce animation. And uh, this was part of the Adadi Kabrit Mohosso, and uh, they are creating animation for some unknown uh, war heroes of the struggle for independence. And we hope that uh, I think uh, the target date is August of this year that some launch will, 15th August of 23, that launch will happen. But what is unique about this collaboration is, of course, this is the first between Ministry of Information and Broadcasting and the private. And uh, as I was mentioning in the morning, because it should not be that we just keep on pushing, putting in the money and without any return. Here, it is a collaboration where part of the marketing is done by Bunjal, so that the return also comes on what we are putting in. And if this experiment is successful, then that opens a lot of doors. For us to put in money, if the money is coming back, that opens a lot of doors. Because otherwise, just putting in money without any expectation of return doesn't really work. Thank you, Mijal. Thank you, sir. Uh, my next question is for Ashish. Ashish, you have been championing the cause of promoting the AVGC sector in India for quite some time. And as I was just mentioning, you have worked with more than 12 or 15 states. 
uh, for them to have realized what the potential uh, that this uh, you know EVG sector has to offer, not only in terms of providing the uh, employment opportunity for the youth, uh, but also to attract more and more industry into the state and also uh, as an outcome to promote the local culture of that state. So what has been your experience and do you see coherence uh, in the way the states have realized the, the value of this particular sector uh, and the contribution it can make to the state GDPs? Uh, yeah, so I think it's a, uh, it's a long, long, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> It takes a real long time to convince any states, and as the nature of our uh, governments, uh, the the officers who support you or who understand get transferred very quickly in two and a half years, maybe some sometimes three years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you get uh, you know officer who has done a policy in the state like Apurva sir did a policy with us in Maharashtra and then he comes as a secretary INB, it helps a lot because you're on a fast track thereafter. But uh, to tell you frankly, uh, every state in India always wanted to have a film industry into their state. And this uh, inspiration of the state is fulfilled by AVGC because the issue is that uh, in 2020, uh, sorry, 2000, uh, we started with uh, AVGC forum in FIKI after the first uh, FIKI frames in 1999. And we also, 2002, we created Best Animated Frames Awards. And then we went to each state, we did a road show. And it became very difficult for, uh, you know, us to see that that state really never had anything uh, to display in terms of, uh, you know, the studio or anything. Uh, so at that point in time, we realized that it's a, uh, it's an important thing that the state's inspiration of making films should start sometime with post-production, should start sometime with animation which can be delivered from that state. And animation itself at that point in, point in time was very new in India. So we looked at all the states which were already having films as a base and television programming as a base. So we first concentrated on those uh, cities where a cluster uh, can be created. And then when people were enough trained, uh, then a group of people went to, uh, like some of them are sitting here, uh, they went from Mumbai, Bangalore and Hyderabad to Calcutta. Many of these people went back to uh, say Indore or Bhopal and now they have studios there. Now those studios are big those studios are hiring 600, 700 people. Uh, so it, it had to start somewhere. And then the government had to be convinced that it's nothing, it's not always about films. It's about, you know, the part of the filmmaking can be completed with this and not only the Indian filmmaking, but even the international filmmaking can actually come to your state like Manipur or, uh, you know, Nagaland or, or uh, Assam. Uh, if we have enough uh, guys delivering, f sitting from here. So when we displayed this, then uh, the confidence actually grew and now the states are so willing to have a policy. And first of all, it was very difficult because the state governments have to still put their act together because some of the states uh, have our vertical under the culture ministry. Some of them have it under the culture and tourism ministry. Some of them have it under the IT ministry. This is the ITBT ministry. In Maharashtra, we have it under the industries ministry. Within industries ministry, there is an IT policy and we are part of ITES. So it becomes very difficult to convince that why do we require a separate animation gaming policy? Uh, because they, uh, it's overshadowed by a lot of other industries uh, and they, they need to understand why there is a need. But the local job creations, the restoration of local art forms, uh, the, the people migrating from local art forms directly into creating animation is uh, something that we need to prove them. And no sooner you have proven one or two case studies, uh, the things become easier for you. And I think uh, with uh, the national uh, education policy 2020, now we are making rounds with Media and Entertainment Skill Council to go to every state uh, board and give them a curriculum from 6th to 12th and ask them to start these programs from 6th to 12th. Then we went to the universities. 
So collectively, it becomes an ecosystem that when university also talks to the local state government, school boards also talk and say, okay, we want to do these programs. Then the critical mass of uh, artists get created. And once that critical mass is there, then a good studio from somewhere would like to have a branch there uh, so that there is, uh, you know, they get out of the rut of poaching from the bigger studios. And that's when, you know, that equilibrium starts getting established. But if it's supported by a policy, it is always good because then the incentive comes in. Uh, what we are talking about, the cluster development, the common infrastructure of, uh, you know, the, re uh, the real estate and uh, the render farms, the, the uh, you know, s studios for sound recording and many other things. All these are common facilities. They slowly come, come up when we actually do the clusters. So I think uh, we are at a stage when most of the states are now wanting to do a cluster. And that cluster development, once happens, it's going to actually establish uh, a very good industry base. And what we are talking about, how do we become a global power? It's only because of the clusters that all the, the creators from the world over would like to see like uh, what Munjal had very nicely pointed out when we were making a policy is we have Make in India, we have, uh, you know, uh, the whole policy of uh, making India itself. It's a time that we look at creative industries and we say create in India. And that would be something which is be relevant for live action films. Uh, to comic books, to animation, to visual effects, to gaming, to everything. And then we need to also fine-tune the policy very, uh, you know, uh, nicely so that Indian ideas start traveling outside. Right now, it's the other way around. If you, if you have to do co-production, it's a foreign idea that we have to go and get a co-production uh, done. When we need to change the, you know, side of uh, the whole equation, and we want Indian ideas to become uh, the, the center point for make, becoming a global property. So all these cluster making is going to help you do that in the future. Thank you, Ashish, for that view. Uh, just continuing on that point, uh, Biren, about the states. Uh, a lot of states have shown the will and the intent uh, in form of a policy, but often the challenges come in the implementation of it. But you have successfully advised the state government of Karnataka to have created a center of excellence which takes a concentrated approach to how uh, the, uh, the, of course, national, international connects happen and also the best in quality uh, content gets generated out of India. So just give us a view of how the journey has been and something that the other states can replicate and learn from. Thank you. Uh, the vision behind what we are trying to do uh, is very much a collaboration of industry and state government. So, since we're talking about what should we do to become global, I'd like to actually first bust four myths. Myth number one, uh, it was referred to earlier, I think, uh, when the presentations was being made uh, for the report, is that uh, we have the manpower in India. Uh, animation, visual effects, games, etc. is nothing to do with manpower. It is to do with talent. It is to do with converting manpower into highly specialized skill sets. If we want to be global in our, what we do, we need to re reorganize India by, by, by lines of craft. Because every frame of film that anyone on this stage makes has almost 12 to 14 different specializations. And uh, it, brings me to my, uh, it brings me to my second myth. And the second myth, which was written on the top of a slide that was shown in the report today, is the extent by which we do back-end work. You know, I object to that anato anatomical reference to what we do because many of us do end-to-end -end work. Uh, and we are at the very front and center of what is happening in the globe. Uh, there are uh, movies by the largest animation player in the world that we are creating in Bangalore end-to-end -end from pre-visualization and design of characters unto the delivery of the movie. It will be out next year, so I can't speak about it. And that's not the first one. So whether it is working for Meta and Zuckerberg, whether it is creating you know, uh, high-end shows that you've seen, uh, we are an unrecognized Oscar. We got 270 people that worked on Pinocchio as being featured at Fiki Frames day after tomorrow. And these 270 people are unrecognized because you think of them as back-end workers but actually they produced the movie. Uh, 
right? And so Pinocchio for Del Toro got that. And I think it's as worthy as anything else that we've done from India. The third myth I want to bust is this whole idea of how we create content. So I think the studio model will change quite a lot. And we are talking about here how we can design and develop something and then do that with studios here. I, I'm actually looking ahead of that. I'm saying we'll design and deliver here and we'll give the work to other countries. <laughs> okay? We may do some of the things that we've been doing. So look at it this way. 75 to 80 percent of the world's rotoscopy, paint and uh, prep happens in India. Right? At the same time, we are 3 percent or 4 percent of the total visual effects market in the world. So what's changing is from being a 100% creator of Roto today, that 30% is very high value work and that's coming in, you know, out here. So I would argue that if you take the top five companies today, you are looking at a situation where almost all the 30% or 20% of the total uh, value of work is happening at the high end, front end of development. So this is the third myth I want to bust. And the last one being that, by the way, Work will follow where money is available. So while we make huge international blockbusters, we had a, a great foray into making Bhedia, which is the first end-to-end -end movie we did in India. It won the Dada Sahib Falke Award day before yesterday. It won awards before that. Why is this happening? Because when you train talent to work on the best shows in the world, then that talent can create the best shows for India as well. So this is the learning and the insight that comes from them. And how do those shows make money, right? Because they have, they're looking at the ability for distribution to monetize it. So all of these thoughts were what informed the COE. And we've had wonderful discussions with the secretary and with all of you on the panel as to how we should reimagine what we should do with the policy, what we should do with the mission, what we should do with the NCOE, the Center of Excellence coming up, where all we want to do is to light the fire. The fire will go on its own. And I think to the secretary's point about, hey, can we talk about not just grants and money being given in a format that doesn't have a return. So I think what we did in, in, in the Bangalore COE was, we made sure that equipments that could not be afforded by the industry. Everyone told us, if you put this equipment and that equipment, it will not give you a return. We said, that is why we are putting it here, so that small, medium and large companies can do photogrammetry, can create digital humans, right? And so, if you look at today what Epic is doing in India with Unreal, and they had a competition for 14 movies, every single one of the 14 movies had to go to the Bangalore COE because that's where the origin of that pipeline took place. So the inventions that we and with Indian talent have done on Jungle Book or Lion King and, and successive movies and Transformers out in the, next, in the next two weeks is what we are trying to bring in as a, as a, as a cascading effect. And I think for, for the people on this panel that do wonderful work with, with Indian titles, until the 360 kicks in, right, with licensing and merchandising and the opportunity to do things that happen abroad. They're very risk averse in the Western world. They make a sequel, you know, you'll do Fast and Furious number 100 and you'll do something else number 40. And until we actually create that universe. So the next phase of what we should be doing across government, industry and academia is to look at now what does it take to catapult it. When we came to Fiki Frames, we were 1% of the Indian media entertainment market. Today, we are almost 15 to 18% of that market as A, V, G, and C, right? Now, how do we make this 1% of the global market to 18% there? So I don't think we can afford to wait 20 years to make that happen. And therefore, this conversation is about that. And the COE is just a pilot. I think many of you here have been to the COE there, and it will inform what we can do. And, and I think one of the things we are looking forward to, of course, is with the, with, with the Secretary's help, right, is to make sure that the center here becomes like a mothership. And the states create a string of pearls. They do different things so that India becomes an ecosystem where all the boats can rise at the same time. Uh, we've incubated a large number of people in, in Bangalore. We have actually managed to get filmmakers, advertising makers, people who actually are in ed tech, health tech. Everyone has used these facilities. And the most important thing there is we work with 27 government art colleges at the bottom of the pyramid, right? So that's really, really critical. I think those are the learnings that we have from Bangalore. And everyone here is welcome to both use it and visit it. Thank you, Birin. We will. Uh, my next question, Vega, is to you. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, OTTs uh, have really taken off, right? If we look at the top three or four OTT platforms, they are in more than 4,000 towns with 80 million subscribers, etc., And you yourself have, uh, in your uh, previous avatar, launched one of the massively successful uh, platform called Discovery Plus. 
the consumer behaviors have changed. Uh, yet we still see that we are a net importer of content as in the content that the, the world has, which India is consuming. Uh, are we missing out with, with the excess these eight OTD platforms have given to uh, the versatile uh, com uh, content? Uh, what is it that we can do as the nation to really create more and more of that content or tap onto this OTT phenomenon? Thanks, Samir. Um, so I think just to give a perspective as well, like I, I have been on both the sides, uh, broadcaster where we were create, buying content and uh, offering it to studios and now on the other side we're creating content. Um, I think there's been an, uh, a journey in the last decade or so where there's been an evolution uh, of content creation and talking a little bit more about animation since this is specifically with AVGC in mind. Um, you know, we were having a, uh, a chat earlier uh, in the afternoon that about 15 years ago, that's when I think Chota Beam completed some uh, 15 years uh, of its existence. That was the first, sh first show which came into the country uh, as an Indian animation series, right? That actually opened the doors for the content for creation of uh, Indian animation. And then, of course, a lot of other shows happen, whether it's Motu Patlu, which still continues to be the number one show in the country. And that's the show we, we, we make as well. Um, so I think the evolution in the creation of the Indian content has happened. Um, but in my view, there is a, some kind of a plateau we have reached right now. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, situation, right? To be, create what Munjal is saying, content which travels outside of the country. Everybody has that desire to create that Indian piece of content which uh, you know, reaches other parts of the world or becomes a phenomena like Korean content has become, you know. Uh, so why is it that Indian content, and this is not just animation, but live action as well, why is it that we're not able to make uh, a Squid Games kind of a content which cuts across different parts of the world? So there is, there is um, the desire. But in the world of animation, I think there is a limitation on multiple levels. Talent was one of them, like Biren highlighted. Um, the economics of running a business in the world, in the animation space in India has a bit of challenges. I think the, the policy which has been, uh, you know, wonderfully created by these stalwarts of the industry um, is fantastic step forward. Uh, but like Munjal and I was discussing that some of these things now get, have to get into execution mode. You know, there's one to say and there's one to do. So we have to get into specificities of how do, how do these different policy uh, uh, recommendations convert, which creates businesses which are sustainable, so we are able to bring the best talent, so we are able to create content which cuts across not only the audiences in India, but globally. So um, there, is, there is a trend you see, there is an intention by every platform, every content creator, even the OTT is actually given an opportunity to a lot of creators today. I mean, it's, if at all there was the best time in the history of media and entertainment, it is now uh, of, for content creators specifically because, you know, sky is the limit. You, you can just create whatever. The talent which has come out in the country on the back of these platforms is phenomenal. So across the sectors, whether it's live action or it's regional content or whether it's animation, um, you know, and the visual effects world, the opportunity exists. Now, how do we, how as an as a industry body are able to create content which actually can uh, stand out, you know, and bring that clutter breaking content is 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 where the challenge is. Um, if you see a lot of the content, you sometimes, and this used something used to be a joke earlier on when I used to be in the television space, like when you used to see a whole lot of soaps, right? You put your hand on the logo of the channel, you wouldn't know which channel you're watching, right? Because everything looked the same. So in mul many ways, some of the content which is just getting created, even uh, across different genres, seems in the similar space, but I think to your question, what is the OTT as a platform offering? Clearly, there is an opportunity. How do we as animator, animation industry create that content which cuts across the globe uh, has to be taken in multiple steps. So yeah, hoping that we are able to um, do that. And just one point to, to sort of uh, close my piece here is, and again, I think over the years, 
for everybody in the room, if you ask, think of animation equals to cartoons, right? Anyone in the room will say, like, what's animation? It's like, whatever the cartoon, it's all kids in the kids' space. I think time has come for us as an industry to get out of that thinking, right? Animation is a medium. It is not the destination. So it is, it is it's time we create content uh, in animation for adults. Why can't we create a South Park out of India? Or why can't we create Simpsons out of India, right? It's not that there isn't an audience, because like you said, during the pandemic, you've just created an opportunity for everybody to watch content on OTT. So the exposure is there, and they're consuming it. I think we should look at um, ideas um, uh, and, and be a little bit more, I guess, gutsy, if that's the right word. And somebody's got to take that punt and say, OK, let's try creating a series which is in animation for adults. And I'm hoping that by the time the next Fiki happens, there would be one idea which some of us have created, which is for the adults through animation. Thank you, Mega. Uh, just um, building up on her point, uh, Jay Hill, uh, she said that if there were ever a time to be in this space, it is now, right? And um, which means um, content production is no longer the bellivic of the big production houses. It's, it's in every household where people have creative ideas and they create good content. But to, with, as, if you look at AVGC, uh, there's a significant dependency on technologies, right? India, uh, uh, unfortunately, and in talking to a lot of companies, we have understood that a lot of, OE, a lot of the technologies that we use are all imported, right? Uh, uh, which makes it very difficult for these young uh, entrepreneurs or content creators to access this high-end technology, which means it limits creativity in some senses. So I just wanted your views on what are those models that you see across the globe uh, wherein technology has been democratized, uh, giving it access to every single household and, and leave the creativity to them. I think Mega is absolutely right that, uh, you know, <clears throat> I'm saying Mega is absolutely right that, uh, you know, if there was a time, it's now. Uh, you know, we've seen many articles about, you know, even in the US, this has been the, the last few years have been called the golden age of television. Um, and similarly, on the, uh, on the creator economy, now whether you take OTT, whether you take social media, whether you take, uh, you know, the, the, there's a burst of creativity at the individual level, at you know, smaller companies, et cetera. Um, I also believe that we are on the cusp of the democratization of access to what is today very expensive technology. Uh, <clears throat> and we were discussing some of this, this at, at uh, dinner. And the reason I say cusp is we are still maybe a couple of years out from, uh, uh, you know, from it to get uh, for real use for some of these AI technologies to, uh, to find common usage. Uh, but we have a lot of people experimenting with technology that is, uh, that can become really accessible at an individual level on, from what today requires very, you know, expensive, uh, software subscriptions and, and is a, is a big PNL item and a pain point for, for a, forget startups. I mean, for a lot of existing medium and even large companies. Uh, you know, I think the COE is, is very much a step uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the right direction for uh, some of these models. So, you know, creating facilities like that uh, with access that smaller companies, even individuals in some cases, can access, um, I think is something that, uh, you know, it, that should be considered this string of pearls of four or five uh, you know, I, I would say why four or five? Yeah. I mean, you know, perhaps every city should have one, at least every, every, uh, every state, two, three cities should have one. Uh, secondly, I think academic institutions, uh, where obviously we are investing in skilling, et cetera, uh, you know, uh, the secretary, the ministry, the industry is, you know, about to embark on that, uh, on that journey with skilling. But I think some of our institutions where we are investing in skilling for some of these have access uh, and relationships with companies that can introduce a lot of these technologies to, to young minds. 
uh, it's a win-win partnership in that sense. It, 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 it creates, it introduces that company's technology to a very vast uh, pool of people. Um, you know, and the greater the scale we achieve, the lower the costs. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, uh, there are, uh, you know, I mean, yes, you're right that, you know, a lot of this uh, software is, you know, MNC software, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> there are several startups now playing in this space, uh, in, especially through SaaS models, et cetera, uh, which, uh, which are starting to come up. I think greater visibility in the funding community is needed around them uh, to, for them to, uh, you know, be able to have a chance of survival and get to the next stage. I would urge the industry to, you know, try a lot of these uh, out as well. And uh, the last is, of course, uh, you know, commercialization of a lot of technology or products that the industry creates as part of, uh, you know, their creation and production process. You know, Indian industry is great at Jugaad. I mean, they're creating their own little, uh, you know, programs and bots and contraptions to create what they need to create to cut costs. But commercializing, thing, having a commercialization mindset that look, I've created this little, uh, you know, middleware to do some work at my company on my uh, production. Can I take that and commercialize it across? That is another way to bring the cost down. Thank you, Jail. Uh, sir, my question to you. Uh, if you look at the recent Oscars, uh, where two of our regional uh, movies made it to that global platform, historically it has been... Uh, I mean, to use the term uh, Bollywood, which has been leading uh, the larger Indian story at a global audience. Um, but then the, if, if you look at during pandemic or post, the regional cinemas have really taken the lead in terms of the originality of the storytelling, the using AVGC technologies and even tapping into the global market. Uh, with you at the helm of it as, it, as the national representative, uh, if we have an NFDC-like body, uh, what, what is it that the government is thinking in terms of really mainstreaming every regional cinemas. Now, some of those regional cinemas are self-sustainable, but if you really look at northeastern markets or other elsewhere, they may, may still need some support. So what is it that we could do? I thought this question will come in the next session. <laughs> <laughs> Not directly related to AVGC. But, uh, so you have been in many <laughs> sessions, so I'm sure <laughs> there will be overlaps. No, but uh, continuing with the AVGC first. Actually, two, three things, two, three more points I would like to make. First, taking off a brain regarding the Center for Excellence. So in the National Center for Excellence, while earlier it was largely more of uh, the spending, what Government of India was doing was largely on construction. So now, again, taking from what they have done in Karnataka, now what we have envisaged is that almost 40 to 50 percent of the technology will, uh, of the our spending from Government of India side will be on the on such equipment which is not easily available to the others. So we'll be, we propose to spend almost 200 crores only on procurement of equipment which is not easily available and then making it available to those startups and others to use it in, uh, uh, readily. Then we are also proposing a, a sort of a seed capital fund uh, uh, for startups, uh, which we can then use that as a, it is a sort of a fund of fund which can be used to leverage with other funds and uh, uh, for a, as an AVGC startup fund, that uh, we can spawn AVGC startup funds in various places, and that is what we are proposing to the states also. Then, secondly, is the issue of incentives, because when we in Government of India announce the incentives, so there we have included post production and AVGC also, which I think is unique because most of the people understand that our incentives are for filming in India. But actually, they go to post-production and AVGC, and that is what I've been telling Virain and others, that since you are doing all this work for the foreign uh, studios, so you should come forward and start taking these incentives, because they are ready-made and they are available uh, straight away, and you are already doing that work. We are also working to simplify the processes, because working on AVGC in a project there, it is much easier to really see that what has been done in India in terms of forex earning. And we did not really go into the manpower aspects, who has worked and what, what all. We did not go into those details. So I think we will come out with a simpler uh, framework for giving incentives for AVGC, and that should help to our AVGC 
uh, sector. And thirdly, again, to, uh, taking off from what I was said regarding our collaboration with Binjal, because last time when I, when I was here, there was a lot of discussion about DD Kids. And today also people mentioned that there should be a DD Kids channel dedicated to animation and uh, uh, giving our stories to our kids. And last time also I mentioned that that is very much possible. But again, don't expect that the government of India will keep on putting in the money and you create without any expectation of return. If there is something that it works on a sort of a no profit, no loss sort of a basis with, for Doodarshan, then we are very much in it. Or even if putting in some money, but don't expect that we'll put in 100 crores every year just for running a DD Kids. So that won't happen, but if it is a sort of a even case, then it is, uh, then it works. Uh, now, coming to what you were saying, yes, I mean, uh, most of the films now have almost 30 to 40% of animation visual effect component. Any film which you see, I mean, people may not even realize that uh, a lot of it is visual effects, and uh, so, and that component will keep going up, uh, will keep on uh, happening, and there we have to leverage our talent, because the work in India, the quality is very high, as Biren was saying, that we work at the top end projects, but even on the routine projects, the, with our manpower and with our quality of manpower and our cost structure, it is something like in IT that we, where we were, we are able to provide the services at a much cheaper cost and a higher high quality to the world. So, animation and visual effects that is also an area where we can do a lot uh, in the future. Gaming is another sector where we have not really cracked the code. I mean. Out of EVGC in the world, which is almost a $500 billion industry, gaming would be $350 billion. But Indian gaming is just about $3, $3.5 billion. So there, there is a huge scope. And because we are, I mean, at, in our, at our stage of economy, we are not really into high-end gaming. But as content creators, I think there is a lot of scope. And for that industry, uh, you are also all into, mostly into movie production, not into gaming. Thank you, sir. Ashish, uh, just continuing on sir's point about the financial viability of, uh, of uh, the many companies in this space. Because you work with a lot of states, uh, we have seen some good incentives that the state offers to the companies for production or setting up shop. Just give us a view on, on, on some of the innovative uh, incentives or financial support that you have seen, something that, again, can be leveraged across uh, the nation. See, the uh, the support uh, that is required on the financial side is uh, uh, in two ways. One is coming into the private equity way. One is into the projects itself. Now, we have been able to now convince some of the bigger funds and the banks uh, to form a specific AVGC fund, uh, which you will see rolling out in the next three months itself. And uh, one of the biggest uh, example that was created was uh, when Sir was in the Defence Ministry, Maharashtra government created a fund which is a Defence Manufacturing Fund, which is led by IDBI, and the, the MIDC has put in 200 crores. So we have been now able to convince Maharashtra government that IDBI leads the fund, uh, MSME fund from uh, centre is available. We are also talking to INB Ministry. Uh, the proposal will go there. But the state government, MIDC, has committed 200 crores to that. So that fund will become a 400 crore fund which will be invested in private equity into the companies which are registered into the state of Maharashtra itself. Apart from that, we also applied for a SEBI-approved uh, fund which is a larger fund uh, which is also coming from various people uh, and various NRIs who want to invest into the media and entertainment. Uh, that fund is uh, going to be led by uh, some of the veterans from the the funding, uh, like the fund management uh, side, but that is also a focused AVGC fund, which will be available for all studios all over the country. Now, if we really need to get to the co-production areas, uh, because the world over, our industry works with the co-production mechanism. The big companies uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that are like technical or deluxe and all, they have an incentive of a different kind in the ACZs, and they don't uh, uh, create original content to, to that extent. They are mostly services companies. But the people who create original content requires the support in terms of development, in terms of uh, pitching those ideas and converting those ideas into the uh, uh, real shows. And that's where the 
a fund for incubation, incubating the idea, which is very successfully done in the state of Karnataka, when, uh, where Abai and the government is doing, and they've funded people to create ideas. Then the support is given to pitch that idea to, to various people, to make it into uh, a complete project. And that's where the incentive is required. That's where uh, you actually require platforms. Now, the thing is that uh, when India had, uh, uh, you know, liberalized uh, the skies for broadcasting and we were all completely dependent on broadcasters at this point in time, uh, there was no restriction on them to create Indian content. So uh, it's at the will of the broadcaster to see whether they uh, they green light Indian ideas or they bring content which is already ready from outside, dub it in our language and show it here. And that's where, you know, our culture gets eroded. And that was a huge uh, challenge that we had. But then Indian shows started getting uh, TRPs like uh, uh, Chota Bhim, Little Krishna and all. We proved them wrong that Indian shows gets larger TRP than your foreign shows. And that's when they started investing. But it is a switch on and switch off situation. So we need certain areas where the incentive uh, to create content, looking at co-production, uh, because if 25,000 people in India work on uh, Technicolor and many other studios and bring about 65% of the revenue, the 1,25,000 people are working on smaller cottage industry, which is actually building the industry to do Indian content. So I think the, the policy has to support both the sides. It has to support larger uh, studios uh, for bringing foreign work into India and also support Indian ideas to go global. Uh, so I think uh, that's where uh, we have given a balanced view. We have also said, we have given a model of uh, how to run the DD kids by partnering uh, into DD. And I think some of, one of the partnerships that happened with Munjal is on a similar line that we have proposed where there's a 50-50 partnership between the government and, and the creator. So I think if those kind of models are applied into DD, because a public broadcaster plays a very major role for greenlighting of new ideas. And uh, in the absence of public broadcaster, it becomes very difficult because world over, the public broadcasters had been uh, actually funding the large productions. And uh, we have seen right from France, U US, Canada, UK, uh, Japan, Korea, they play a very major role. So apart from a pay TV, I think the producers here, if they are getting empowered and they are able to keep their rights uh, with them, then they are able to build it on, uh, you know, those rights as a, as a security uh, that those rights will keep on bringing them money. But right now, when you go to the broadcaster, you lose all the rights. And that's where there is a big challenge, uh, you know. So I think we are wanting to find an uh, in-between way uh, of making sure that the creator of this country should be able to retain those rights. And this incentive should actually give them an empowerment to uh, be at a level playing field with uh, other counterparts in the world so that they are also going to say, okay, if your country is giving this, my country is giving this, let's do it together, the broadcasting would do. And it's not that the, the uh, co-production funding doesn't uh, bring back money. It brings back money for everybody. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Bujal, my question to you is going back to uh, the original content. Uh, with the success of Bahubali and the RRRs at a global platform, tells us that uh, there is an audience that Indian storytelling has found. Uh, but if we really look, and then the younger generation is really tapping into that sp uh, space. But still, as uh, Ashiva was saying, that uh, it's been a hit and miss, right? Not all of those stories find the success. So if I were to really advise the young entrepreneurs or MSMEs or startups who are creating content and can tap it to the global audience, what is that code that they need to crack in terms of uh, what is that storytelling or what, uh, what are the Indian stories that find their resonance uh, with uh, the global audience, uh, non-Indians as well? So I think uh, fundamentally, I think any piece of content when you look at it, I think you are looking at it from the standpoint of, is it different, right? Number one. So when you look at content, I mean, if you just look at, look at the kind of content we are consuming today, we're consuming a lot of Korean content. Why are we consuming that content? It comes from a different cultural space. It's very different from what we are used to consuming, right? Obviously, uh, that's one. Second is quality of content, right? 
So most of these shows, if you look at the production quality, is extremely high. And I think uh, one of the factors, particularly I would say in animation, is that we need to raise the bar in terms of quality. Our own show, KTB, I think one of the reasons why it went on to Netflix is also the fact that the production quality was very, very high. You know, so so I think that's 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 again a very important aspect. You know? So I think anything that you look at creating, are you able to offer the global audience something unique, something different? Right. Number one. Two, you know, I think it's about striking that balance that how much of, you, you know, if you talk about from a cultural perspective, how much of that culture influences your storytelling, you know, and I think it's, 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 it's a very tightrope walk, right? How much of the Indian influence do you bring in so that the product is esoteric or unique enough? At the same time, it's not too overwhelming that I, do, I need to be an endophile to appreciate the content that is coming out, right? And it's that, that balance. So, I mean, we did a show called Deepa and Anu with Netflix, you know, and Biren, to your point, I was the Indian creator and the entire work, actually international crew worked on it. You know, we had Daniel Lindgren, who was a five-time Emmy award-winning music producer, who did the music, right? The entire production happened out, you know, but it's an Indian show created by an Indian creator with an international crew for a global audience. Netflix released the show in 27 languages, right? Uh, and we were very, very lucky to, to have won not one but four Kid Screen Awards uh, at Kid Screen in Miami earlier this year. We won the best new show, best inclusivity, best music, and best talent. I think, I'm not sure if any other show has actually matched that in one year, right? So that's endorsement that Indian content books, right? The story is about a six-year-old girl and her pet elephant, and she's born in a family that runs a bed and breakfast hotel. I think it's as Indian as the, 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 the motel industry in the US, right? You can't get more Indian than that. But I think the telling, the, the storytelling, the aspects, how, how much of the Indianness we're bringing in, it's finding that right draw. You know, even right from what we want to call those characters, right? I mean, like the first voice, voice cast that came back to me either had a very thick Punjabi accent or a South Indian accent, you know? Or, I mean, should we call the uh, family Singhs or should we call them Swami? And I said, no, I don't want either of them, right? Uh, the first cut of music that came had only sitar and tabla in it. And I said, hey, there's more to India than just these two things. You know, so I think it's about that voice and understanding that audience, you know, your global audience. That a kid sitting in South America, a kid sitting in London, a kid sitting in Sao Paulo or New York or Washington or Detroit has to be able to appreciate it, right? And I think that's, that's the tightrope walk that as creators we need to find, you know. So, so, and I believe that people are seeking Indian content. I mean, the two Oscars is proof enough. I mean, that, that, you know, there's a hunger for our content. You know, it's about just finding the right kind of pitch and obviously going on and taking a punt. You know, it took me 10 years to, to get to that point of eventually getting a show with a partner like Mattel on a platform like Netflix and for it to become a Netflix original. And it had no track record, right? It was, a, it was an original IP. It's straight away launch on Netflix, right? So you have to be patient. But you know, I you know, I firmly believe that that where we are today, I think there's a tremendous opportunity. You know, and you know, honestly, kudos to Apurva sir and the team. Honestly, at every forum, the language that people from the ministry, Apurva sir, you know, it reflects the fact that they have understood the pains of the industry, you know, and they are putting it into policy. And I think let's also take cognizance of the fact that this is policy 1.0. It doesn't stop here, it starts here, right? I mean, Canada took 25, 30 years to perfect their co-production you know, policies, right? I think we've just started. So I think we have a long way, and I think we made a good start. I think, I think the fact that we were able to see these policies from all over the world and bring some of those best practices in, right? So I think it's a good start, and you know, kudos, sir, I would really say hats off to Apurasa and the team. I think they deserve a round of applause for the time and bandwidth that the ministry has spent on this sector. You know, in my 15 years of serving as a co-chair at Fiki, I have not seen that kind of commitment from any previous team at INB. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mijal. Uh, the feeling is mutual. Uh, the role that Apu sir has played in terms of leading us all in the common direction. Uh, moving on, may I have a question for you? You did touch upon uh, in your previous talk about, you know, animation is often juxtaposed with 
sorry. Uh, animation is often juxtaposed with cartoons, right? And traditionally, the audience has been children. But lately, we have also seen that there is a more, more and more of adult uptake and also the content. Uh, uh, we can look at a Shrek-like movie or Ice Age, which still had, uh, which was still intended for the younger audience, but had a lot of adult audience as well. Mm, so I have two questions for you. Uh, uh, what is it that, uh, if you look at animation in particular, uh, is the approach that the content creator should take when they are targeting adults uh, as far as animation is concerned, number one. Number two, uh, do we really have that kind of skill set? I mean, uh, at least in talking to a lot of, in fact, Mohit and I were also talking in terms of the skills that are available in India with respect to animation to that level is still in its uh, you know, progress stage. So, so what is your view on the skills that are available in India and what is it that at least your experience has been? and what needs to be done. <clears throat> Thanks, Samir. Um, I think I'll just build on what uh, Munjal was mentioning. Um, so clearly, uh, there is an opportunity which exists in terms of creating content for adults uh, and animation being a medium for that. Um, but uh, in my view, when you look at the kind of content which has been cutting across everywhere, whether it's kids or live action. Uh, I think it's ability, it's the, um, it's the story, and it's the ability to tell that story in a way that it connects and relates to the audience you're reaching out to. Uh, so it goes beyond the quality versus, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quality is important, surely, but it is also about you may have the best looking product, right? Film industry has shown us that you may have the a great actor, but the movie didn't work, and something from nowhere comes and you know hits, makes a box office hit. So it's it's all about the ability to tell the right story, um, and also when you look at the content which is coming from globally and we ourselves in India are consuming, uh, sometimes it's not about the particular country's culture which is being exported. It is again how you've connected with that audience with the storyline. So, uh, if, you know, when you look at some of the kids' animation content which is getting consumed, some of the big consumption are shows like Doraemon and, and Shin-chan. I mean, which country culture are we talking about that, right? But it is the number one show in so many ways uh, which is being consumed. So, what is connecting? Kids are loving that show. Why? Because you're talking to them. It's... You, you understand them, you talk to them, it doesn't matter, it's not the best quality of animation, but it connects, right? So I think um, the opportunity lies in, in various platforms, not only in kids, but in adults as well, but it's really about understanding the story and connecting with the audience. Coming to your talent question, it's a big challenge, big, big challenge. And I think Biren touched upon it as well. Um, the ability to create, so I think this is where probably the op sort of look, taking a half, glass half full approach to this is that there is a lot of content being created out of India which is doing extremely well. In the last few years, you've seen some fantastic talent uh, content on the OTT. Now, if you convert that talent into animation, for example, it's again storytelling. Animation is just a medium. I think there is an opportunity which lies. Somebody has to take that first step. And like we always say, in hindsight, everybody's a genius, right? And then you can just say, oh, wow, that's a great idea. We should have, you know, we were, we were talking about it in these forums, but somebody has to do it. So I think um, <clears throat> we, we really would, it'd be wonderful to have content creators uh, across, whether it is in the world of animation and the live action, to collaborate and look at some kind of stories which can be created, talking to the adults, whether within the, and OTT is a great platform. This is where they are taking uh, bets, they are taking uh, risks. And, and I think, I mean, uh, Deepa and Anoop is a great story as well. You know, I mean, it took him a lot, many years to convert that. But um, so are shows like uh, Mighty Little Beam, for example, which is doing extremely well on Netflix as well. So there are different, there are great, there are examples but they're few and far between. Do we want more of that? Absolutely, yes. How do we go about it? I think that's where the conversations have to happen. There has to be collaborative approach between creators 
and platforms. Um, and like uh, Mr. Chandra was saying that, you know, just like government doesn't want to just say, take money and, you know, I just give money and figure it out. But I think there has to be a collaborative approach. And that stands true even in the private sector. And I think that is where we're hoping that some of us are able to crack that formula. So, you know, I think obviously the maturing of the audience in India is slowly happening. And I think that there are enough experiments also happening. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched a movie called Bombay Rose, right? It's a, go and watch it. It's still available on Netflix. It was made by a friend called Gitanjali Rao. Beautiful film. Clearly not meant for kids. It's a mature subject. Uh, beautifully done. I think it won the Khan's award also, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, Closer Home, uh, we did uh, two documentaries with Discovery Plus, again, when Mega was there, with Neeraj Pandey's company, where we used animation to, uh, to the storytelling. We did, a, uh, we did uh, two documentaries. One was uh, Secrets of Sonali, which was about a discovery, archaeological discovery that happened. And the second story that we did was Secrets of Koinur, where we, in a 90-minute documentary, two-part documentary, almost 25 to 30 minutes is animation. And animation was used to, used to tell the story of the Koinur. The entire B-roll, which was the entire history of Koinur, was said using animation. So I, the point I'm trying to make is that I think it's also about your ability and willing to experiment. You know, uh, a lot of things today, like something like South Park, even if you go and check how it started, it was started by a bunch of guys saying, hey, let's do something different. Nobody commissioned them, right? They went out, took a punt, it became popular, and that's when the big boys came and said, oh, please do more, right? So I think as creators, many times you just need to put yourself out and say, yaar, isko karna chahiye. You know, so that's it. Thank you, Vijal. Thank you, Mega. Uh, my last question, uh, we're into both you and Jehil. Uh, why it is important one? Because you uh, lead one of the largest global um, uh, organization in the AFGC space. Uh, and Jehil, uh, you, you, uh, you look at the sector across the globe and also across the value chain as well. So, uh, when we talk about AVGC, at least in the in the in the recent times, it has been with the M&E lens, as in filmmaking and gaming and and all of that. But I just read somewhere that the whole concept of metaverse is going to contribute uh, 1.4 or 1.5 trillion dollar to the Asian economy every year by 2030. Uh, which would mean that there would be many more use cases of AVGC technologies and skills uh, beyond just the media and entertainment. So I just wanted to pick your brains on what do you see uh, as the use cases and, and what should be the channel uh, where we progress towards it? So that's a, that's a great place to, uh, to end because that's going to be about the new beginnings in this industry. I think it's really important to recognize that the reality that we see today is broken. It's also very important to realize that I talked about, you know, 70, 80% of certain types of work coming into India and visual effects will get broken. Um, I think we also have spoken about the fact that, you know, there's this whole services angle. And if the topic is how to become global and get those big numbers is going to come from services, the IT industry hasn't cracked the idea of creating products. Uh, and of course, there's a lot, and you know, that's, that's an ongoing conversation. I think the mentalities to create products and the cre mentalities to create services is very different. Uh, companies like ours are trying to join the 1,600 GCCs in India, global capability centers that actually will catapult India into a much larger space in the technology area. And applying this here is important. I think we need to end on three questions that we have to ask ourselves, just the Indian context. Why has so much venture money chased games? The venture money is in hundreds of millions of dollars that has come in, not for the nefarious purpose reasons that we think and accuse them to do that. They are legitimate companies that create legitimate outcomes. They see the opportunity of India making for the world. They see that there is a home market of 550 million people, but they see a world market of many other billions. That's the reason people put money where money will come back. Even the government is saying that. But the government has to act like a launch at a, at a NASA base, right? Where they create the first level of propulsion, and then the rocket goes and you know uh, it goes on its own into into where it has to go. And we talked of funding earlier. We actually have a, a fund called Kitwin Four. It's the third fund that was three IT funds, and now there's a AVGC fund in 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 uh, Bangalore. The difficulty is even to get people to create business plans to come and take this money. So after you create the fund, your problem doesn't end; it starts. 
Okay, uh, we have got two calls for applications in, in with STPI in, 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 the far, in the Northeast, where people who are really smart and who know what they want can't articulate that in terms of coming and taking an application. And the other, I think, two points that were made uh, earlier was, you know, really about uh, um, international movies, regional movies, and Oscars. Awards are a byproduct. You don't make a movie to win an Oscar. You make several movies, one of them wins an Oscar. The fact that you won an Oscar is a great accomplishment, a great tribute, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the, the conversation about today is the commercial conversation. It's the conversation about everyone says that, you know, oh, look at the movies and what we've done abroad. By the way, 900 crores was the local collection of RRR. 195 crores was the, was the international collection. Hollywood movies, which have, was to get five and seven crores in India, are getting that kind of money from Indian audiences today. So let's actually make the right benchmarks because we shouldn't be looking at the wrong benchmarks in order to create the industry's uh, next uh, story. Can we do much more than 195 crores abroad? For sure. Should we be doing that? Yes. You know, uh, till about 10 years back, US collections and box office of all the big movies were 65% local, 35% international. It's the reverse today. So even Hollywood starts looking at the global market, and I think those are the kind of benchmarks we should be looking at. In the interest of time, I'll pause here. But uh, I do want to, again, compliment you, Apurvaji, for your leadership. I don't know. I think the AVGC future lies in changing the government rules and not being able to change the Secretary INB. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just take a minute to address your question. Uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, we need to look at the market just beyond media and entertainment. Um, the addressable market, if we expand our minds around both animation, VFX, and gaming, of course, is a massive, massive sector. Um, globally, much, much bigger than the media and entertainment traditionally. Uh, but <clears throat> even if you take the applications of these skills within things like pharmaceuticals, within things, I'll, I'll give you an example of what us as Deloitte are doing, right? We have a, we have a practice or a division called Deloitte Digital, where we are essentially, uh, you know, we are essentially a, a, an agency, a, you know, a marketing agency we do. But we have now hired hundreds of people with these skill sets, with filmmakers, animators, designers, at a, what you might call a traditionally, you know, consulting or, or you, know, you know, tax services kind of firm, because we are doing digital transformation work around the globe, which is being executed here, uh, where we are doing UI, UX, you know, people's custom, custom applications need these kind of skills. Product demos, the automobile industry, the real estate industry, uh, simulations. So, so the addressable market, at least for services, is massive, as well as for products. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, so I mean, it's many, many times what we are talking about today in terms of media applications. Thank you. I think we are out of our time. So, as I close, I just want to draw a parallel for you all. Uh, uh, I don't know. You should, okay. Uh, it took uh, the Indian IT industry 30 years to become a $200 billion industry employing uh, 5 lakh, uh, 50 lakh people. Uh, as far as AVGC is concerned, I don't think we have that much of time. Uh, sir would not allow us to do that. Uh, so, so, and why am I confident? Uh, for the last one year, I've had the ringside view to the industry, the government's inaction towards a common cause of making India a global hub. And with uh, Sir's leadership and all of you on the dais and many more in the audience, I am very, very confident that India can achieve that number in a very, very quick time. So thank you, all of you, sharing your views, and thank you for listening in.